We come now to the last in our series of four programs. We've seen what the Bible is and how the Hebrew and Christian scriptures were written, then gathered together, and then preserved for future generations. And we've also seen the incredible evidence that the Bible that we have today is essentially the same as originally written. But remember, this is a book whose writing was finished before the year 100. That's a long time ago. The preservation and circulation of the scriptures over the centuries is an extraordinary saga. The Bible has amazingly survived despite vicious attempts to destroy it. In 167 BC, a brutal and mad tyrant, Antiochus Epiphanes, ruled over Israel. He determined to destroy the identity and religion of the Jewish people in a merciless and ghastly persecution. He ordered all copies of the Jewish scriptures destroyed. The books of the law that they found they tore to pieces and burned with fire. Anyone found possessing the Book of the Covenant, or anyone who adhered to the law, was condemned to death by decree of the king. The Roman Emperor Diocletian instituted the Great Persecution in the year 305 AD. He attempted to exterminate the church and decreed that every manuscript of the Bible was to be seized and destroyed. He had the words Extincto Nomine Christianorum, the name of the Christians having been destroyed, put over the ashes of a copy of the Bible. But the scriptures have long outlasted Diocletian and Antiochus and other rulers who've tried to do away with the Bible. Other obstacles also kept the Bible from the people including illiteracy and language and cultural barriers. The church in the Middle Ages spread to diverse peoples who spoke many different languages, so the scriptures were taught in many different ways. The written word was still basic, and the monasteries carefully attended to the copying and preservation of the Bible. They made sometimes magnificent and beautiful copies, reflecting the reverence the monks accorded to the Bible but these did little to feed the souls of the common people. This was before the advent of printing, so every copy was done by hand. A single copy of the Bible could take up to a whole year for a scribe to write. But even if the Bible was available, most of the population could not read it. For example, in 14th and 15th century Europe, only 10% of the population could read, and only 2% could read effectively. So the Bible was taught in an amazing variety of ways. Pilgrimages took on great importance in the Middle Ages. Then, as now, there was special interest in visiting Jerusalem and the land of Israel to recall biblical events in their original settings. Sculpture depicted biblical people and events. Church music incorporated content from the Bible. Church architecture featured carvings and depictions of biblical themes. Stained glass in churches surrounded parishioners with biblical stories. Great artists spent whole lifetimes 
painting only biblical themes. Drama in church services in medieval Europe told the stories of the Bible. Here, the angels meet the women at the tomb of Christ, and the story of the resurrection is told. At times, many plays would be given on one day in the chancel of the church. The dramas grew in popularity and moved outside to the marketplace. You see the boat on the right for the story of Jonah. The plays could last up to three days. Then there were the mystery plays and the pageant wagons that would roll through town one after another. Here, Adam and Eve are driven from the Garden of Eden. Here, David faces Goliath. So even in periods and places of illiteracy, the Bible was imaginatively given to the people, utilizing multiple art forms. But over the course of time, the church that was in so many ways a civilizing and a spiritual influence itself fell prey to the lust for power and wealth. Corruption increased. Superstition infected and distorted the gospel. Accumulated tradition was mixed with scripture, which often conflicted with its teaching. But over and over again, reform efforts emerged from within the church. The Protestant Reformation in particular centered on the recovery of the Bible for the daily lives of the people. One of the most significant early reformers was a 14th century Oxford philosopher and priest, John Wycliffe in England. At my trial, he was more. close to common people and consumed with a May burning passion to purify give the you church. Peace, my daughter. One third of the land of England is owned by the church, my Lord Bishop. Such ownership is not the business of the church. Christ and his apostles lived in poverty. Might we not do well to imitate their example? Your own mouth condemns you, Wycliffe. First, you seek to undermine the authority of the church, of the bishops, and even of the pope. And now you instruct us how best to bring about our own downfall. You leave little room for doubt what the verdict of this court must be. One last question, Dr. Wycliffe. What spiritual authority would replace the one that you have just so effectively demolished? Your own fevered brain. No, Bishop Courtney. The only true authority. The Word of God. The Holy Scriptures. Forrest. Yes, Doctor. I don't think I shall be needing this any further. Wycliffe's demands for reform cost him his prestigious position at Oxford University. This exile propelled him into the most important task of his life. My task now, our task, if you will, Nicholas, John, if you will, is to use this exile to translate the Holy Scriptures, all of them, into English. Our native English tongue so they can be heard and understood by all our people. Wycliffe and his followers began the momentous task of translating the entire Bible into English for the first time. Then they trained humble preachers to bring the Bible to the common people. We really dare to give the word of God in the common tongue into the hands of the common people. Do we fully understand what we are doing? Will some not abuse, misuse and misinterpret the scriptures? My brethren, of course some. But has keeping the scriptures as the property of the hierarchy and the clergy prevented misuse? No, indeed. It has furthered its abuse. 
We will give God's word to God's children and his spirit will guide them. It will take time for growth and understanding. But I fear what judgment may befall us if we dare not give out this word. Church authorities moved against Wycliffe, but he died as they prepared to silence him. Wycliffe's followers were hunted down and imprisoned, but Wycliffe's influence was so widespread and despised by church authorities that they dug up and burned his bones 44 years after his death. But he had started something that could not be stopped. He is commonly hailed as the morning star of the Reformation. Martin Luther, a German Augustinian monk in the early 1500s, played perhaps the most visible role in bringing the Bible back to the churches. For I have sinned. Luther's have burden of guilt continually tortured his soul. No matter how hard he tried, he found no comfort in religious God. ceremonies. He is holy. But in his study of scripture, Luther discovered the inner peace he so desperately sought. He found that forgiveness was not to be earned, but was a gift of God received by faith. At that time, indulgences were being sold in Germany to help finance the rebuilding of St. Peter's in Rome. These indulgences promised forgiveness of sins for the payment of a price. Luther could not now stand by and see forgiveness offered in this way. On October the 31st, 1517, he posted his now famous 95 Theses challenging indulgences. It was a quiet act, but was to become, as they say, a hinge of history. It set off an immediate furor across Germany. Luther argued his case before church authorities. In matters of faith, I think that neither council nor pope nor any man has power over my conscience. And where they disagree with scripture, I deny pope and council and all. A simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without. The church tried to rein in Luther, but the more he prayed and studied, the more he disagreed with the Roman church. Luther was called before the emperor and given one more opportunity to recant. Martin Luther, you have not yet answered the question. Give us a simple answer. Will you recant or will you not? You ask for a simple answer. Here it is. Unless you can convince me by scripture and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. While Luther's teaching spread to many parts of Europe, in England, William Tyndale, a brilliant young priest, took up where John Wycliffe left off to bring the Bible to the common people. At an eventful dinner meeting at the home of his employer, Sir John Walsh, the determined young Tyndale encountered the local clergy. But the church has so many persuasions. One man follows Don Scotius, another Thomas Aquinas, another Bonadventure. If all these learned men are in contradiction one with each other, how can we know right from wrong but by God's word? God's word says, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. 
Give the scriptures to ignorant men and they'll soon be tearing out their own eyes. Hither and yon will be a nation of blind men. Without God's word, we are a nation of blind men. But without the help of doctors, God's word is too hard to understand. And that is to measure the yardstick by the cloth. There are as many doctors as there are pieces of cloth, but only one yardstick of scripture. By what should we measure that? By the Pope. And what if the Pope is at variance with God's laws? Then it were better to do without God's laws than the Pope's. Well, young sir, what do you say to that? If God spares my life, I will see to it that a ploughboy shall know more of the scriptures than you do. Nothing could dissuade Tyndale from his pledge to provide scriptures for the common people. Church authorities in England prohibited him from translating, so he fled to Germany to work. His translations were smuggled back to England. When he was only about 40 years old, he was betrayed, captured and put on trial for heresy. His only defence was scripture, the book that he had devoted his life to. Take him away. And fifth, you assert that neither the Virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. How do you answer? I answer thus, with a clear conscience before God and man, that I have never maintained, affirmed, averred or asserted anything contrary to the plain meaning of God's holy scriptures. On these alone, and these alone, I stand. Tyndale was condemned and sentenced to death. Before he died, he uttered a simple prayer. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Tyndale was executed in 1536. The following year, King Henry VIII authorised the use of the Bible in England among the common people. That English Bible was mostly Tyndale's work. It provided the basis for the Reformation in England, and it was a remarkable fulfilment of Tyndale's dying prayer. The advent of the printing press made possible the spreading of the Bible as never before. But it didn't happen all at once. This Welsh Bible belonged to a young Welsh girl, Mary Jones. In the summer of the year 1800, Mary Jones set out from her home in this Welsh village of Clanfernel to walk 25 miles to Barla in North Wales. She went alone, most of the way barefoot to save her shoes. Through the beautiful countryside she trudged on. Nothing could stop her. Not even the approaching thunderstorm. For six years, since she was ten, Mary had wanted her own Bible more than anything else in the world. She raised chickens and sold the eggs to earn money to buy the Bible. When she saved up enough, she set off for the only place in Wales where she could buy a Bible. That place was in Bala. Twenty-five miles later, she arrived and found Reverend Thomas Charles, who had the Bibles, but he had only one left, and that was promised to someone else. When he heard Mary's story, Reverend Charles decided that the other person could wait. Mary at last would have her own Bible to read to her heart's content. Mary's youthful dedication touched the hearts of Christian leaders in Britain and sparked the formation of the British and Foreign Bible Society in 1804. From that beginning, Bible societies sprung up all over the world. They now distribute millions of copies of scripture every year in hundreds of languages. From the earliest days, believers have hungered for the scriptures in their mother tongues. 
For centuries, Bible translation proceeded slowly. Here, you see the number of translations made century by century. But now, look at what has happened in the last 200 years. There are at least portions of the Bible now in over 2,000 languages. Today, it is envisioned that within a generation or two, the Bible may be translated into every known language on earth. Thousands of gifted linguists work in remote areas of the world right now to achieve that goal. The Bible has dramatically changed countless people's lives. This can be seen right across history in people from widely diverse cultures and social backgrounds. Augustine, born in North Africa in the year 354, was a brilliant young student. He chased after the popular philosophies of his age, lived with a woman not his wife and fathered a child out of wedlock. One day he read the scriptures and his life was turned inside out. He devoted himself entirely to God. As the old Roman Empire crumbled before barbarian advances, the writings of Augustine examining the ways of God with the world became foundational for the Middle Ages, and his writings are still widely read even today. Francis of Assisi in Italy was the son of a wealthy merchant. The words of Christ in the Bible prompted him to forsake his fortune and to take up a life of service. His love of God, humanity, and nature influences multitudes to our own day. John Wesley said how his heart was strangely warmed in 1738 by Luther's preface to the New Testament book of Romans. Wesley went on to lead a movement that raised the whole moral climate of England. Some historians said his movement may have saved England from bloody revolution. Billy Graham, a farm boy from North Carolina, was never head of any church or religion. Yet he brought the message of God to more people than any other who ever lived. Why have so many millions from every continent wanted to hear him? Mr. Graham's message has always been based on the Bible. The word of God has not changed. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever, says the Bible in Isaiah 40. This book, I believe, was revealed by God to man. It is our guide. It's our compass through life. And God says, the word of our God shall stand forever. And who has not heard of the work of Mother Teresa caring for the most wretched and poor. She said her work is based on the words of Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, where Christ said that we minister to him when we care for the hungry, the poor, the naked, and the sick. These are some of the most gifted and influential people who have ever lived. They made rare contributions to our world. What they have in common is that they all submitted to a call that they heard from the pages of the Bible. The Bible's influence in our civilization is simply unparalleled. It's inspired some of our greatest art, influenced the formation of our major institutions, and it's lifted our Western societies from barbarism to civilization. It's an old book, but somehow what it says about the meaning of life, about what it means to be human, about what's important, about how we should live, about how to find peace with our souls still speaks to people today even as it has in every generation since it was given. I'm Russell Bolter. Thank you for joining us.